Hello, sci-fi and dystopian thriller fans. My name is Jess, and this is CamCat Unwrapped. You've been listening to Death Warrant by Brian Johnston, which won a gold medal in the Best New Voice category and a bronze medal in the Best New Book Fiction category at the IVPA Benjamin Franklin Awards. Today, we have the author, Brian Johnston, Brian Johnston with us here for a virtual interview, and we're so excited to get to chat with him. Brian, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Looking forward to it. Yeah, this is going to be a really fun chat. Um, why don't we just start with you telling us about yourself? Uh, well, see, I worked in television, uh, local television, for about 25 years as a writer producer, and also had the distinct pleasure to to be a movie reviewer on TV for about 10 years, which was the sweetest part time gig you can possibly imagine. I didn't have to pay for a movie for 10 years, and I was seeing, you know, two movies a week for 10 years, and I had to go on TV and tell people what I thought about it. So that was pretty sweet. And then after I got out of broadcast, I worked as the creative director for uh, some video production companies where we were doing videos for Microsoft and Starbucks and Amazon and T-Mobile and companies like that. And then I got Just out Just small of that. time, no big deal companies. <laughs> and then uh, now I'm the creative director for a audio series streaming service, which is really fun. So again, you just get to be a storyteller. So it's a pretty sweet, pretty sweet gig. Yeah. Wow. So you said you even went on TV to do some of your movie reviews. Was there like a program that you were working for? Yeah, it was a, it was a local program uh, called Good Evening in uh, Portland when I was living in Portland. And then also um, for a show up in here in Seattle for a couple of years. You say it so casually, but that sounds like such a big deal. It's it very so cool. Fun. It was. It was just a lot of fun. Oh, that's so great. Well, it, I mean, clearly you have a background then that helped inform your writing of Death Warrant, which you know obviously centers around this TV program that uh, kills people. <laughs> you know, that's no surprise to to our listeners because they've been listening to. Uh, to the whole audiobook, some of them, and some of them might just be getting started. So, uh, but no spoilers here. Um, or at least I didn't spoil anything. <laughs> but yeah, so yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> how would you say that your background helped you? How, how did your background help you write your story? Well, I, you know, I, working in local television, uh, I was working for, I worked for the NBC affiliates, I worked for CBS affiliates, I worked for ABC affiliates. And I'm not, and this is going to be blasphemy for a lot of people, I'm not a fan of reality television uh, because it's not very real. You can't believe how scripted reality TV really is. And that always, that always bugged me. So I thought, you know, it'd be kind of fun to, to make fun of reality TV. And so that was kind of one of the things behind this. Um, and then I've got, you know, one of my... Uh, my lead character, Frankie, she's a mentalist. Well, when I was a kid, when I was in junior high, I did magic shows and I loved magic and I thought that was kind of fun. And then being Frankie loves uh, loves old movies and I love old movies. And Frankie loves Pink Floyd. And I love Pink Floyd. <laughs> so I just, just took elements from my life and uh, put them all together to make a movie and make a book. That's great. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like Frankie is in a lot of ways modeled after you. Is there anyone else in your life that you feel like is reflected in your story? No, but you know, uh, I was, I didn't get married till I was 38 years old. And so I, I dated a lot. And so I, that was one of the parts of the book that I really enjoyed writing was when she goes out on the first date for the first time in 10 years. So I was, I was reaching out to my friends who are women and asking them what, you know, tell me what's going through your mind before you're going on a, on a first date and uh, get, you know, picking their brains. And I just remember what I would go through when I was getting ready for a first date and what was on my mind. And so that was a lot of fun to weave into the story as well. Yeah. I mean, it was very fun to read. It also sounds like a lot of fun. I usually ask people what kind of research they do to inform their books. And it sounds like you had to do your research on things that, I don't think 
a lot of us would even think to do research on like somebody who isn't you going on a first date. That is, yeah. I mean, you really have to be able to step outside yourself. And clearly that required a little bit of research. That's so fun. Are there any other areas that you research before you? Or Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Mentalism, which is fast. Mm. Mentalism, you know, it's, it's not, it's not magic, but people perceive it as such because mentalism is the the art of persuasion, getting people to to think and say what you want them to think or say. And there are some videos online when you go looking at mentalists and what they do. It's absolutely remarkable. I mean, they can manipulate people in ways that you can't even possibly fathom. There's one video that I watched. And I wish I could think of the name of the guy, the mentalist, but he brought on Simon Pegg, the actor, Simon Pegg, okay? And he sat down and he was talking with Simon, and the week before, he had had Simon write down on a piece of paper the one thing he always wanted to have growing up as a birthday present, mm -hmm. okay? And he folded up and put it in his wallet, and then he came back, and he sat down and he talked with Simon for a minute, one minute. And then he said, Simon, what is it that you always wanted to have for, for a present? And he said, a BMX bike. He said, you sure about that? And he goes, yeah, absolutely. The guy turns around, opens up a box, and there's a BMX bike. Wow. And Simon's like, how is that even remotely possible? You knew that I wanted a BMX bike. And he says, well, take a look at the piece of paper inside your your wallet and he opens it up and it said a leather jacket so in that one minute conversation he got simon to completely forget that he wanted a leather jacket and that instead he wanted a bmx bike because he already had the bike there and he persuaded him to think that he wanted the bmx bike wow and so i thought okay that is so cool and so i got this character frankie and that's what she does she performs and does these things, but she also can use it outside of performing to help benefit her in ways that I won't go into. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, I'm sure that's exactly the kind of magic that you were doing in middle school when you were. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. Well, that is very cool. And it's actually so funny. Um, not that this is either here. I was just thinking as you were telling that story before you got to the end of it, uh, as you were, as you were telling how he was thinking about what he wanted when he was a kid and wrote it down, I started to think, okay, how do, how would somebody just kind of guess what someone would want as a kid? And the first thing that came to my mind was kids probably would want a bike. I bet he wanted a bike. So it's funny that, you know, he was able to kind of convince him that he wanted a bike. I was convinced and I didn't, I wasn't even there. <laughs> but he was doing these really subtle things. He would slip in, you know, like he would say a sentence and would emphasize the B or emphasize the M or emphasize the X. And he would touch him on the sleeve when he would say those things so that they're registered with him. And it just, he just kept slipping in little things about bikes that you wouldn't even pick up on consciously. Um, and uh, it just all went into his head. To the point where he had forgotten what he had actually written and changed. Yep. Well, and that clearly is a very valuable <laughs> skill for skill. Frankie and for, yeah. for any mentalist. Wow, that is very cool. Well, okay, so yeah, it sounds like there had to be a good amount of research done on that front, um, but I think I mean, like I said, those things don't seem inherently obvious to me, at least, as things that you would have to research. I would have thought, and granted, you've now had 25 years of experience that I didn't know about in this field, but that you would have to do something more on the TV production side. So how much of the, you know, production side of the things that were going on at Death Warrant um, did you have to research how much was from memory, from just your own experience, and how much was kind of fabricated because, you know, this is obviously a format that yeah. isn't a little, usual. <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit of everything. You know, I work, when you work in television, you, you know you know what a control room is like. You know who does, does what. You know what a director does and a producer does. 
an executive producer and how salespeople get involved in that. And so I, I've got some insight into the, the workings you know, of a TV station and how to put on a TV show. So I had that. Um, and then I also just, I, you know, I made stuff up. I just made stuff up. Why not? Because that's fun. Because making stuff up, can be, yeah, because it, it can be a lot more fun than, than real life. So I did a little bit of that. Um, and then I just also had to had to do some research too, um, as to how to make some things happen, how to make some things work. You know, um, I, I spent so much time trying to bulletproof the logic of the story because you know I, I, I do. I guess are the do the view are the viewers that familiar with the story? I should. That's the first question I should ask. Um. So it depends on when they're listening to the interview. The way that we usually are doing this is um, we are releasing the entire um, audiobook as episodes. And then once the entire audiobook is out, we take down everything but the interview and the first two episodes. So people who are really on it and listening to it every day right away will have at this point heard the entire book. Um, and then also the hope is that people who have listened to your audiobook separately from our podcast are also tuning in to hear what you have to say about Okay. Um, your book, uh, but people who aren't as active in our podcast or who are hearing about your book for the first time m will might it's possible they've only heard the first okay. couple of chapters. So they are reasonably familiar with the whole premise. Yes, yes. Just wanted to be clear on that first of all. Yes, yeah. No, that's why. So that's why I said that. What I said earlier was not a spoiler because anybody who knows the premise, knows that that's what the book is about. So that's really cool that you were able to tie in some of the things from your real life. Um, and then you said that you also were in the writer's room for, for quite a bit yourself, working on this, these television and movie sets. You know, not, work, not working on, you know, TV shows. I was, a, I was what was called a promo, promo writer producer. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I've, I currently, I work in writer's rooms with, uh, my team of my team of writers for the, my my current company. So I'm well I'm well versed with that whole process. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask how is that different? How was writing this different from doing some of the things that you've done for the on the production side? Well, I mean, writing a book is that's a whole completely different animal. Writing a book is is an all consuming thing. You know, my wife my wife can testify to that. I come home from work, have dinner, go to the gym, come home. See ya. Go into the basement, and she doesn't see me for two hours, and that's pretty much, you know, my life for a year. Writing a book, disappear into the basement, and you're right, and because I don't. So for some writers, they do it as a full time job. Great, good on them, wonderful. Um, I don't have that luxury, so uh, I have to be able to write on my own free time, and that takes a lot longer. It takes a heck of a lot longer. So, the process is just, you know doing all of your research, getting all of your information together, then breaking down, you know, the scenes, first chap, you know, the first act, the second act, the third act. Um, it's just like a movie. Writing a book is just like writing a movie in that regard. You got your first act, second act, third act. First act is probably going to have around 12 scenes. Second act is probably going to have around 25 scenes. Third act is probably going to have around 12 scenes. And you start breaking down the scenes. It's funny. Um, on a, on a book that I'm currently writing right now, I wrote uh, the scenes that I heard in my head. And then after I did the whole thing, I wrote down the scenes of the whole book. I went back and I counted them. And I, and I, and I went, okay, how many scenes before I'm pretty much at the end of act one? And I counted them out and I was like, 12. <laughs> then I read until I got to the end of the second act and I went, I just did 25 more. So without even thinking about it, in my head, I'd already thought it out as a three-act story with 12 scenes in the first act, 25 in the second, 13 in the third. Um, so, you know, the more you start, the more you write, the more you just subconsciously already know, you know, where the first act is going to end, where the second act is going to end, how much time you needed to, to uh, devote to the first act where you got to have that cliffhanger 
Um, you know, where is the night of dark souls where everything goes to hell and the hero is at the end of the rope before something turns around at for him at the end. Sure. Wow. Well, that's so cool. First of all, just to hear that that's kind of the process that you go through when you're writing other things in addition to books. But um, can, I, can, I, can I show you something? I don't, please, know I, can, yeah. I don't know if I can get my camera to see it, but I'm going to try my best. Okay. Keep turning. Now you see that on the wall? That's your planning board. Well, that's actually perfect because I was going to ask you. We have some authors who are planners and some who are pantsers. I was going to ask you, but then it seemed so clear to me that you're very much a planner. Yeah, those were, those were all what you saw was Act 2 and Act 3, and each, each sticky note is a scene. And I would just write two sentences describing the scene. So then... If I go up there and I go, oh, boy, this doesn't work here. Let's take it off here and put it down here and move this one up there and things like that. So there's software, there's software that does that also. There, there are apps that do that. But I'm more of I, I'm a tactile guy. I like to be able to stand back and look at it on my wall and just see how it, the story plays out and walk up and read it. So. Sure. Do you ever have to just completely scrap a post-it note? And then for those of you who are listening and not able to see, I, we just got to see this beautiful wall that Brian has put together of, I assume, all the different scenes of the book that you're currently working on or a past book? It's a book that I've, I wrote about a year ago, and I'm just you now I'm just now in the process of trying to, to, you know, sending out the query letters and the whole nine yards to see if there's any interest. Right. Wow. Well, that is very cool. I, it's very clear then that you are a planner and that that is something that really works for you is, is laying out exactly, you know, the 12 scenes and then deciding, okay, you know, I'm going to switch these two things. That's so cool. And I assume that there's a kind of a similar process then when you're doing that for like movies and TV, that, you know, sometimes you have your post-it notes and you have to switch them. Are there, I mean, I feel like I've seen literal post-it notes just in some behind the scene videos, but do you feel like that's often the process or do you think that? A lot of, lot, a lot of writers, they'll, they'll just use, you know, um, you know, note cards and bulletin boards and stick them up all there and you just pick it off and move it and tear it up and throw it away and write a new one and move everything around. So. Yeah, it's just, that's the the system that works for me. Sure. Well, so you said that you've written other books in the past as well, uh, and that this is your first, no, not, I mean, not, like, first published by someone who is not you, right? Because you had um, independently published your previous novels. I've self-published three books because, because, A, I didn't feel like going through all the rejection. B, I was impatient because... From sitting down to write a book to finishing the book, reaching out, sending out the query letters, finding a agent or a publisher who's interested, and then it actually getting to a bookshelf, that's a two-year process. It's a two-year process. I didn't feel like waiting for two years. And it was a book that I just, you know, I knew that the interest, the, the those books, the interest wasn't huge it wasn't national it was very regional and so i just self-published them myself okay because i was impatient didn't want to deal with the rejection and i knew it was a small audience but um but for the books that i published through a traditional publisher um was interesting i had uh six about nine months before death warrant came out i had another book published by a completely it's a completely different genre from a completely different publisher, um, it, I mean, it's, it is the polar opposite of Death Warrant. It's a book called Deep in the Woods, um, and it's a it's nonfiction. It's a true crime book that deals with a, a nine-year-old kid who was kidnapped back in 1935. It is the, one of the most fascinating stories I've ever stumbled across in my entire life. The fact and you said this, nonfiction, too. Yeah, wow. The fact that this this story has not been made into a movie is a crime. It is an absolute crime. It is the, it is, it is amazing. It's an amazing story. Yeah. 
So that sounds really interesting. It is. It's a great story. Well, I was going to ask you, um, just you had mentioned you self-published some things and then you've now kind of gone through the pu- traditional publishing route. What made you change your mind? Death Warrant, I believed in so thoroughly. There's an interesting backstory to this. So I wrote, I, st- I started writing Death Warrant probably four years ago. Okay. And I just had this concept. I was driving to work and I was used, I would frequently use that 45 minute drive just kicking around ideas in my head. And I had an idea in my head. I thought, would you want to know when you were going to die? And I thought, that's interesting. Would I want to know? Probably not. And so then I just started tinkering with that idea. And I said, okay, what if somebody could monetize the idea of killing people? Okay, how can I even turn up the heat on that? All right, who would do that? Who could benefit from that? And I went, a reality TV show. So that's how the idea came about. I loved the idea so much. I just loved the idea. So I sat down and I wrote the book. And then I went through the whole process of trying to find an agent, trying to find a publisher. And I think I went like 0 for 40. Okay. Just failed, 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 failed. Then I stepped away and I started working on my other book, Deep in the Woods. And I spent a year writing that book. After I finished it and it got a publisher was interested, I was like, great, wonderful. So I was, my, kept, my brain kept coming back to death warrant because I believed in it so much. So I went back and I had a friend of mine who, you know, was really into sci-fi and thrillers. And I said, I want you to read it and I want you to give me some notes. I need, I need a beta reader because I, I can't see the forest for the trees. And so he took a look at it and he offered me some really, really good insight, wonderful notes. So I took those notes and I implemented them. And then I made some other changes of my own. And I was much happier with the product. And so then I reached out to, again, uh, uh, different publishers and stuff. And then CamCat came calling. They called me on April Fool's Day and and said, We really like this. We want to publish it. And I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so interesting to hear that that was that the it started as an idea of who could profit off of this idea of, you know, knowing your death or knowing when you're going to die because I would have assumed that uh it was the other way around that being that you have a background in television and and that those kinds of things that you would have thought okay, you know, what would make for interesting TV, knowing that somebody's going to die. And, and so that's really cool that it was the reverse way. I, I wouldn't have expected that. Reverse engineered. Yep. So I'm curious, what was the hardest scene for you to write in your book? Because you're such a planner. I imagine you just had everything really thought out. Although, you know, maybe the notes that your friend was able to give you aided in making some things easier or perhaps implementing them made things harder? What was the hardest scene? The hardest scene was writing when Frankie does her great big performance and sit in front of 500 of the richest, most powerful people um, and where everything comes to a head. Because I had to make sure that I wrote that so that the reader can't see what's going to happen next. And that was hard work. Let me tell you, that was hard work. Well, and you mentioned that you put so much work into making sure all the logic was airtight. So I imagine there were just a lot of things that had to come together exactly right for that to... Yeah, precisely. So I was really working hard to make sure that I was leaving breadcrumbs so that people, you know, it's kind of like, think back to, you know, Star Wars, when when Darth Vader says, Luke, I'm your father, and the entire theater goes, oh, okay? And every single person in the theater, their brain is going, rewind, 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 oh, back through two movies to go, oh, it's true. I saw the things, but I never put two and two together. So I wanted to make sure that I did that so that they would go, oh, my God. Oh, yeah, 
she did this, she said this, oh, I should have seen this, but I didn't. So I wanted to make sure those things were in there, but they couldn't see it coming until it was too late. And then when things all happen, they go, oh, of course. Oh, that is so great. And those are some of my favorite things too, when you can kind of see the hints as they come, but are just completely blindsided to when it actually happens. And that was something that I did really enjoy about the the big moment too. So um, I I love that. That's great. It's so fun that you put so much effort into that because it it was one of those moments, at least for me when reading it, that was stunning. So well done. <laughs> um, we have all been listening to the audiobook of your story. Um, and people who are listening to the podcast, that is most likely what they're familiar with as well. So what was your experience? Have you heard the audiobook? What was your experience listening to it for the first time? I think, and, and I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say this, but I haven't listened to the whole audiobook. I've, I've listened to the first, like the first couple of pages just because I was curious to hear what the voice talent sounded like. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, okay. And that was it. That was it. You're not the first author to say that. So that is totally fine. Well, then I will ask you a different question. What was it like since you have other self-published books and then it sounds like you had another book that you went through the publishing ring for, but Death Warrant was really the one that you kind of had your heart set on for so long. What was it like holding that in your hands for the first time? It's a wonderful feeling. It really is. When you when you see your book, you know, on a bookshelf, where you see when somebody reaches out to you saying, I, I love I read your book and I loved your book, it's such a wonderful feeling. It's so fulfilling. It's um because authors write books because they have to. Okay. Write because you have to. You know, it's like being a teacher. You don't, you, it's a, it's a calling. You do it because you, you've got a story inside of you and you have to tell it. And so when you get the story out there and then you discover that some people are enjoying it, um, it's such a cool feeling. It is such a cool feeling. Um, you, uh, I have not, I've, I've read one, I guess two reviews of my books. Um, and I think that the only reason I read them was because Cam Cat sent them to me to, to look at them. Uh, otherwise, I I make it a point never read a single review of any of my books because I know that I'll simply focus on the negative ones if there are any negative ones. Um, and so I just avoided that. But the best review, and this one was the reason I liked it because it was so utterly sincere, is my, my dad is not a big reader, and he's certainly not a big Know, sci-fi type reader, um, thriller reader. And he came up to me and he says, I loved your book. Brian, you are an excellent writer. And I was like, I mean, he was so utterly sincere. It wasn't, I'm trying to make my son feel good. Sure. Not like the parental obligation. Good job, buddy. No, no. It was my 90 year old dad saying that. And he was so utterly sincere. You could see it. It was just evident. And I was like, this is the greatest praise that I've ever received for anything in my life, bar none. Oh, that is so cool. That must have yeah, been such a special moment to, to have that with your dad and to know that it was genuine, but also to know that he read your whole book and, and enjoyed it in the ways that you hoped that a stranger would. That's really, really cool. And it's whenever... Uh, you know, somebody tells me that they read it. I always have to ask him. I said, I'm going to bet right now, even before I even asked the question, I'm going to bet you five bucks that you didn't guess the ending. And they went, no, I didn't guess the ending. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I know I didn't. I definitely did not guess the ending. Guess that ending. There's no <laughs> way. You're, I spent so much time trying to cover my tracks. That's really cool. And it's great to know that you spent so much time on that too, because I've, said this to some other authors, but I feel so strongly that the times where you put the most thought, you know, where you as the writer put the most thought and, and hard work into those scenes, I feel like as a reader, I feel that. And yeah. I feel the most connected to those moments. So it is really great that 
um, every time I've talked to an author and I've asked them, you know, what was the hardest scene to write or what was the scene that you put the most of yourself into, nine times out of 10, it's the scene that I felt the most connected to the story in that moment. So not surprising. Not surprising. Yeah. So it's, I, I just have loved hearing that that was so intentional for you. Because another thing that Um, I've talked to authors about too, is I'm always curious when reading a story or even looking at a a painting or a sculpture, what things were intentional and what things were happy accidents or things that messages that people are taking away that maybe weren't supposed to be these big messages, like the books that we read in high school that we have to just absolutely tear apart the wording of every single sentence, you know, the catcher in the rye type books. Um, Were those supposed to be books that implemented all of these devices so that they could be read in schools? Or were those just someone pulling something out of their heart and people recognized that and were able to take messages away from it? So it's always very cool to know when it was absolutely intentional. (laughs) Yeah, I would imagine, you know, that that most most authors they they write simply what they feel needs to be there, and a lot of times that just makes the story built out and well rounded and enjoyable for the reader. So that's really great, and yeah, like you said, you have a story in your heart. Many authors do that just has to get out there, and I'm so glad that this is out there because now all these people get to enjoy it. And I really, it just warms my heart so much that you had that conversation with your dad. That's really so special. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit um, because I'm so curious being that you have a background reviewing, reviewing movies. And then this book is obviously centered around that in, or not the movie industry, but you know, the TV and, and the industries are so parallel in so many ways. Um, if the book were to be made into a movie, if death, death were, or, you know, who knows, maybe even a TV show be in that there are specific scenes and, and it, it definitely plays out like a TV show as death warrant is, um, who would you cast? Emma Stone. Not even, not even a question. It's not even a question. Emma Stone. Yeah. I, I can I'm see huge, it. I'm a mm-hmm. huge Emma Stone fan. Always have been, her, you know, her whole career I've, I've been impressed with. And she's got that, that, uh, that snarkiness that, uh, and she's just, she's got the personality. She's got Frankie's personality. So anybody else outside of you know, every other character, you know, Mike, <laughs> Hasegawa, Galen, all sure. of those could care less. But Emma Stone, Emma Stone, Emma Stone for Frankie. Is Frankie. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now that you say, I feel like I always have those moments where I kind of see a blurry picture in my head as I'm reading. But as soon as somebody, most of the time the authors say, oh, I actually pictured this person. It's like now suddenly all I can see is that person as that character. So I absolutely see Emma Stone as Frankie. That's perfect. That's so great. Um, So you had mentioned earlier that you have other books out. Um, and that you're currently working on a new one. What can you tell us about your other books? You mentioned the one based on the missing boy. Um, yeah. What other things do you have out and what are you working on? Well, uh, that book, Deep in the Woods, which is the, the 1935 kidnapping of a nine-year-old boy. His name was George Warehouser. The Warehouser family in the Pacific Northwest is a very well-known family because they, they're, they're timber barons. And uh, the Warehouser family started with uh, the great grandfather of George, and he's to this day still considered like the twelfth richest man in American history. The Warehouser family owns basically four percent of the entire state of Washington, where I live. They own, or are the stewards of. This is a really goofy statistic: one six hundred and fortieth percent of all of America. Okay, so back in nineteen thirty-five, nine-year-old kids walking home from school, he's snatched off the street, he's kidnapped, he's kept locked, he's kept in a hole in the ground, he's kept chained to a tree, he's kept locked in a closet, and then there's the the kidnappers and trying to get the kid back. The whole story—it's just like I said—it's an absolutely freaking amazing story. So that's deep in the woods. Book that I've just finished writing that I'm shopping around right now is called Hazel and the Fabulous Podcast, a Fabulous Vampire Podcaster, which is a young adult 
middle grade uh, thing. It's kind of, I've got to do some work on it because it's right now it's, I feel it's too young for young adult and too old for middle grade. It's kind of in the tweens area. So I'm going to have to work on that. And then I'm also, I've worked, I've got a, a children's picture book that a friend of mine who's a really talented illustrator and I have been, uh, have finished. And so going to start reaching out to publishers with that here soon. So that's, uh, that's plenty for right now. That's plenty for right now. When you said that your books are, you know, never the same genre, or, you know, all sorts of different, they really, you are all over the map with your stories. That is so cool. Yeah, all over the place. Oh, the middle grade one sounds very fun, or, you know, not quite middle grade, not quite YA one sounds very fun. <laughs> it's, a, it's a girl, her name's Hazel, and she is super smart, brilliant kid, but she's completely socially inept, and she wants to be one of the cool kids. But she can't be because she's completely socially inept, and so the uh, she starts she starts looking for advice from the one last remaining vampire on the planet, who actually happens to be a podcast. He runs a podcast called Mister Know It All because he's seven hundred and eighty three years old. He kind of knows everything, and so she's trying to tap him for dating and fashion advice. And he is absolutely not interested in giving it to her. That's, 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 that's the story for that. Yeah. That's so fantastic. I really love that. Well, we are nearing the end of the questions that I've had for you and of the interview, but there was something that you showed me before we got started that I thought our viewers would really love to see. And I wanted to ask you some questions about it as well. Oh. Um, would you want to, to grab it and talk about it? Sure. Sure. <laughs> So Brian is going to grab um, this thing. Then our YouTube viewers can see. Brian, tell our podcast listeners what our YouTube viewers are looking at. Uh, this is this is an Emmy Award, so it's not, so a, cool. it's not a national Emmy Award. So I want to just preface it that this is what's called a regional Emmy Award for. But still, um, so neat. So this this is pretty cool, and I, I'm, I am. What is it for? Oh, this was what was this one for? This one was for, uh, this was for actually a um, some sound design that I did for a commercial years ago. Um, wow! And but I uh, I am blessed with I've got eleven of them. So uh, for oh my gosh, writing and producing uh, promos and things like that. Again, uh, the regional. So don't get too excited. It's not for. The entire but country. Still, still, how many good. people can say they've won eleven Emmys? <laughs> yeah, it's I, I'm I'm very proud of them. I'm very very proud of them. They're pretty cool. Is there one in particular that is your most proud moment that you got an Emmy for? Well, it, there's one that's sitting down there on the floor that I love because the the label on the side with the name and everything is upside down. No. <laughs> They screwed, oh, wow. up, they screwed up when they put it together, and that's my favorite one. You know, if if you had 11 of them, I think I would also be pretty uh, attached to the one that was slightly different than the rest. Exactly. Yeah. That's so fantastic. Well, Brian, uh, what are you reading right now? Um, <sighs> I'm reading Dune books. I've read, I've read like... Most of the Dune books. I love the Dune world. And I think I just finished reading Mentats of Dune. And right now I'm reading The Sisterhoods of Dune. And I've already read Dune and, and Emperor. God, I mean, I've read so many Dune books. I've lost all. But they're, they're, they're so well written. And the worlds are so fully developed and, and uh, realized. And they're so melodramatic. They're like soap operas in space. Um, they're just fascinating and so i'm going through a hardcore dune phase right now and once i finish once i finish these current two dune books i have no idea where i'm going to go to next i keep hoping i'm going to stumble across my favorite book of all time favorite 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 by a million miles is um a gentleman in moscow by a, a more tolls I love that book so much. I can't even begin to tell you how much I love that book. When I finished reading it, I literally, when I read the last page, I set it down. I just went, oh, that is the most brilliant book I've ever read in my life. 
Um, I, I, I have not been affected by a book that much, probably since I read like The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings or something like that when I was younger. It blew my mind. And I can't wait to see the movie when it comes out because the protagonist is such a likable guy, which is which was a driving force when I wrote uh, Death Warrant because I really wanted Frankie to be a really likable character because nobody wants a protagonist that you just don't like. And so I was so taken by uh, Count Rostov, I think was his name, in uh, A Gentleman in Paris that I thought, okay, or Gentleman in Moscow, that I need to make a character equally likable. So... Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it also lended to the suspense of the whole situation she was in because you don't want to see her, you know, get taken well, by the show. Bits, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that is so, so cool. And I love that that helped inspire, you know, part of, at least in that respect, parts of your character. Mm -hmm. So that's really neat. Absolutely. Well, Brian, we have uh, reached the end. Um, where can our readers, our audience find you? Oh, find me. Well, there's uh, Brian with a Y, Brian R. Johnston dot, is it net or dot com? <laughs> uh, well, I've got one that's dot net and one that's dot com. So Brian R. Johnston. So one of them is like my professional website and one of them is my book website. And I forget which is which off the top of my head. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This is so fun. I loved picking your brain of all the things that inspired this book and other things in your life. Oh, thank you. I had an absolutely wonderful time chatting with you. Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. And to the listeners at home, you can find Death Warrant in audiobook print and ebook formats on our website camcatbooks.com you can find camcat unwrapped on all major podcasting platforms or watch us on our youtube channel and make sure you follow us on social media at camcat books thank you all so much for tuning in and unwrapping another one of our books to live in with me my name is jess and i will see you all next time here on camcat unwrapped